Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful we can come into your house. God, that we can lift our hearts and our hands to you. Lord, your love never fails. We thank you, God, that you sent love to die on the cross for us. We're so grateful tonight we can come into your house and hear your voice, follow you. God, tonight we ask that you would just speak to us by your Holy Spirit, the true teacher of the church. We acknowledge tonight that it's not a man or a woman, not the young or the old, not the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine, but we came to hear from you tonight. Holy Spirit, be welcome in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. Lord, and we'll give you the praise, glory, and the honor for it. God, as you do your part, we'll do our part. We'll give our interest, our attention, Lord. We'll put our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. God, speak words tonight that I didn't even say. Lord, I ask that we all would be attentive to your voice. And here's specifically the, the word of God that you want to deliver to us. God, tonight, we don't ask this blessing only on ourselves. We'd also ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, there are brothers and sisters, and at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we're co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God, we ask that you bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Episcopalians and Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapel, Harvest, Oak Valley, the Way, Ecclesia, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, God, four square denominations, the Assemblies, God. Oh, Lord, we pray for our Catholic brothers and sisters and uh, for the Adventist brothers and sisters, God. If they're preaching your gospel truth, Lord, we bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. Tonight, get your Bibles out. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. While you're turning there, I'm going to tell you a little story. You're fired. The words hit him like a ton of bricks. Took his breath away. In fact, it felt much like when he was a child falling off the swings and the breath was taken completely out of his lungs. As he gathered his thoughts and his belongings, he left for the last time, wondering what life was going to be like in the future. One day, he'd gone from working in a high-rise to working on a high-rise, found himself a job behind a wheelbarrow, pushing cinder blocks up to be put in place by the tradesmen. It was back-breaking labor. Really, the only thing that kept him at it was his faith in God and the fact that he had little ones at home that he needed to put food on the table for. Now, the boss was no help. The boss artfully used curse words to put down the employees, thinking that that would motivate them. Some of you guys know the type. In fact, sailors and drill sergeants would blush at some of the crude curse words and the ways that he would artfully craft his language. And after a while, the man could no longer put up with it. He, he felt just discouraged. He felt deflated. Couldn't believe what was going on. His first week on the job, he felt like a failure. Felt like he couldn't go on anymore. And while he was mustering up the courage and the strength to go in to face this mean-spirited boss and tell him that he wasn't going to show up for work the next day and brace himself for what was about ready to happen, the boss approached him, much to his surprise. He was holding a little white envelope. And he walked up to him and said, Hey, Here's your first week's salary. And by the way, there's a lady in accounting who says that she knows you. Says that she goes to church with you and, and, and she seems to think you're a really good guy. Who'd have thought, huh? And the boss left him there with his jaw wide open and walked away. The man stood there for a moment thinking about what just happened and considering the fact that for the first time he had heard his boss speak without using a cuss word, and while he pondered on this, he realized, I wonder how much I got paid. So he opened up the envelope, found the check, but with the check, he found something else. He found a little note in it from the woman who knew him from the accounting department. And the words of that note said something very simple and yet very profound. It said, when one part of the body of Christ suffers, we all suffer with it. Just wanted you to know that I'm praying for you these days. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the subject of encouragement. We all need it. Even your pastor needs it. Everybody needs encouragement. All of us 
struggle from time to time. We can all get discouraged. Sometimes life just happens and we get discouraged. Sometimes you look at the news reports and the things that we've been struggling with as a nation are still happening. They're still going on. Things are still not resolved and you can get discouraged. Sometimes the grind, sometimes the, the drive, sometimes the monotony, sometimes the lack thereof, right? Hey, sometimes it's not that there's so much activity. Sometimes there's no activity and you just get discouraged. And it's in these times that we have to understand what encouragement is really all about. You've heard our founding pastor, Pastor Jim Cobre, he said this many times, that people will only go as far as they are encouraged. It's vitally important for us to understand encouragement and what the Word of God has to say, because did you know that your God is an encouraging God? Did you know you can't get around God without being built up and strengthened and encouraged? Even in your weakest moments... God still has the ability somehow to put strength in you. You could be dying all around. You could be having a breakdown. You could be just totally in a place of loss in the hardest moment of your life. But the moment you get around God, all of a sudden you've got the strength to stand. And even though God may bring something to you that might feel like it's wounding you or, or hurting you or, or, or maybe you feel like God just knocked the wind out of your sails or something happened, even though you might feel like God may be working against you, the fact is God is for you. And you're encouraged. Why? Because, well, hey, even if God's stopping me or even if God is holding me back or even God's doing something, God's good and he's up to something good and he has a purpose and a reason for this. You just get around God, you get encouraged. Tonight, maybe you haven't been encouraged. Tonight, maybe you came in discouraged. Maybe tonight, you don't need any encouragement, but you know what? There's going to come a time where you need it or someone else around you needs it. And so I want to just give you a couple of things about how to be encouraged. How to be encouraged. First thing is this, if we're going to be encouraged, we've got to know how to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. You've got to know how to build yourself up in faith. I had you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 30. 1 Samuel chapter number 30 is a, a, quite an interesting chapter. If you have time, I would encourage you to take a, a look at this story. King David at the time was out of the nation of Israel. He's in a place called Ziklag. There in Ziklag, him and his mighty men, they would go out on raids secretly. They were in the territory of the Philistines, and uh, they had given him Ziklag, and so he was staying there, and him and all his men, all their families, everybody, and they would go out on these raids, and as they would come back, they would bring back the spoils secretly back to their camp. It was during this time that they went out, and they were going out, and they were raiding, they were doing different things, that somebody came into Ziklag where David's family was, and they raided the camp. They raided the town. They took all of the women, they took all the children, they took all the goods, they burned it with fire, and they left. Now, you can imagine the feeling and the rush of emotions that David and his mighty men had as they came back to Ziklag, seeing smoke coming up from the place where they were going. How their hearts must have dropped, how they must have been discouraged. In fact, the Bible records in 1 Samuel chapter number 30 that as they approached Ziglag and as they started to see what was going on and as they realized really what had happened, they looked around and they sat down and they wept until they had no more strength to weep. Can you imagine a big warrior? I mean, I picture Mel Gibson in Braveheart, right, with the blue paint on his faith, face, just sitting down and crying and sobbing and, and, and just weeping, you know, and this big burly man, barrel-chested with a sword at his side, just sobbing and crying until he has no more strength to cry. We've all had those moments, haven't we? We're middle of the night, we've been up, we've been under stress, we've been under pressure, and we've cried and cried and cried and cried and cried until we had no more tears left in us. My goodness. But then the Bible records something very interesting. 1 Samuel chapter number 30, verse number 6, it says, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. Now, if you don't know what that means, stoning him meant that they were going to throw stones at him until he died. So in other words, they were going to kill him. Here are the men who had followed David into battle. Here are the men who had pledged their lives to him, and now they want to kill him because they were mad about the fact that their sons and daughters had been taken away from them. So they said, let's kill David. This is wrong. And I can imagine David was greatly 
distress. You got those type of guys that are going out raiding with you and now they want to turn on you and kill you. You got problems. But look at what David does. David doesn't just say, all right, boys, start casting stones. I deserve this. He doesn't roll over and die. He doesn't run for his life. He doesn't keep crying. Look at what David does in the rest of the verse, verse number six. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's an amazing statement. See, we can get so discouraged that we forget about God. We can get so discouraged that we go away from God and we say, God, why are you doing this to me? God, why has this happened? God, everything's gone. Everything's been stolen. God, I don't have anything left. God, I might as well roll over and die. And yet David shows us something different. He says, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David prayed. David sought God. David actually calls for the priest and and, and they consult God. What should we do? And the Lord gives them a plan moving forward. And guess what? They recover everything. All the women, all the children, all the goods. They overtake the, the guys who had taken all their stuff and they get everything back. See, it is not over until God says it's over. But if you never go to God, you'll never hear the word that it ain't over yet. If you stay in your discouragement, then you will be the one deciding that it's over. But if you go to God, God will give you the plan. God will encourage you. God will strengthen you. God will give you the grace you need to move forward and to move past the discouragement. Why? Because you can't get around God without getting encouraged, without getting built, without getting strengthened, without getting His nature, imparting His grace, His ability on your behalf. And now all of a sudden, you can face the day and you can recover everything. Come on, is somebody listening tonight? See, our primary connection with God, if you're going to strengthen yourself in the Lord, our primary connection with God is in prayer. Where you just take it to God. You know, I love the scene in the movie, The Apostle, uh, great movie, you know, uh, theologically, I don't know, you know, but, it, but, but some great stuff in that movie. And there was a scene where he was up in the middle of the night, he's at his mom's house and he's upstairs and he's just shouting. He's just mad and he's yelling. And one of the neighbors comes over and knocks on the door, and the mom answers the door, and she says, can I help you? And he says, hey, there's, there's all sorts of shouting going on. She goes, oh, he's praying. He's praying. What kind of prayer is that? Well, sometimes he talks. Sometimes he shouts. And then she closes the door. See, I know in my own prayer times, there have been times where I've had to get just real with God. Just raw. God, this stinks. See, when you first get saved, you don't know if that's appropriate prayer language, right? Sometimes you don't know, so you just do it anyways, and you didn't realize that, you know, you were supposed to say, uh, you know, the these and the thous and be holy and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes we, 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 we unlearn some good habits. The Bible says that God desires truth in the inward parts. And when you can bring to God your discouragement and unpack it for him, God already knows He already sees beyond the surface level. You can have the biggest smile plastered to your face if you're dying inside, God knows it. If you're discouraged, He knows it. And He understands it. Jesus robed Himself in flesh and was tempted as we are, yet was without sin. He came and He lived in a flesh body. When Jesus' friend Lazarus died, The Bible says he asked to go see the place where he lay. And when he went to that place, even though he knew what he was going to do, because he'd already told the disciples, I go to wake him up. He already knew what he was going to do. But even in that, Jesus came to a place where he saw the place where he laid and he wept. Jesus understands your emotion. He understands your hurt. He understands your pain. But listen, when you start to get around Jesus, things that you thought were dead, start to resurrect and come back to life. Because you can't get around God without getting encouraged. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 in the New Testament says, but you beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, you can strengthen yourself. 
Each and every believer has a responsibility that when you are discouraged, when, when you feel weak, when you feel like you can't go on, that you go and you build yourself up in the most holy faith. It's just like eating. Tonight, I wanted to make a healthy choice with my dinner. And so I decided that I was going to go to one of those juice places and pick up something that tasted like they just got it off of the clippings of a lawnmower and drink that for dinner tonight. See, it's not always the popular thing to do. It's not always comfortable. It doesn't always feel good to go to God and tell God, I'm hurting, I'm discouraged, and I need encouragement. Sometimes you don't have the time in the day to make the healthy choice. Sometimes you, you've got pressures, you've got demands, you've got the kids yelling at you, you've got to pack lunches, there's soccer games, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And yet, if you are discouraged, you have the responsibility to do the tough thing. And to take it to God and say, God, you know what? I need to be encouraged. I need to strengthen myself and stay off the junk food, get the good food, and get it in you because you can build yourself up in your most holy faith. Now look at what he says, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's a, a faith-filled, focused, fervent prayer towards the Lord. Sometimes that's in English. Sometimes that's in Spanish, if that's the language you pray in. Sometimes that's praying in tongues, if you have that prayer language. The Bible says that he who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. You can build yourself up as you pray in the Holy Ghost. As you start to pray, yeah, your understanding is unfruitful, but there's something going on spiritually that you're building yourself up. It's in those moments that the book of Romans says that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groans and utterances that can't even be uttered. There are times where your prayer life will go from, oh Lord, to ah, you just can't even say anything. You're travailing in prayer, and now the Holy Spirit takes those groans. Sometimes all you can do in the presence of the Lord is cry and sigh and moan and groan. Listen, if that's all you got, that's all you need because the Holy Spirit is able to turn that into a prayer. That's our God. That's amazing. But you've got to get into the presence of God. You've got to take him your cares. Cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. That in itself should be an encouraging thought that the God of the universe, creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who made everything, the one who knows you inside and out, cares for you and knows exactly where you're at. How to be encouraged. First thing is to build yourself up in faith. Second thing is this is look to the faithfulness of God. Look to the faithfulness of God. Each and every one of us have traveled a road. Each and every one of us have, have walked through this life. There's a journey. And along the road, God has done some amazing things in your life. I don't care who you are. I don't care where your journey has taken you. God has been there every step of the way. You know, you might have been a mess up, a screw up. You might have been, you know, some, just so, somebody who, who wasn't really the, the, the star person. You might have been, been the underdog. You might have been somebody who put yourself in that position. You could have been a gangster. You could have been a business person seeking pleasure and fame. And wherever your road is taking you, God has been on that journey with you. God knows the road that you've traveled, and it was God who kept you alive. It was God who brought you to himself. It was God who knew the steps to get you you on track. It was God who healed you. It was God who restored you. Come on somebody, has God done anything in your life? Has God saved you? Has God raised you up? Has God healed you? Has God blessed you? Has he blessed your children? Has he blessed your family? Has he put you in a family? Has he given you a, a, a new nature? Has, has he given you his grace? Has he given you everything that you have? I mean, has God done anything for anybody in this place? Remember that old song? When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. Right? I'll skip to the chorus. Makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you. See, just think about what the Lord's done. The, on the road, if you have to go back, mentally down the road that you've traveled and put some roadside monuments. If you need to put marker number one, marker number two, historic landmark number 637 along the road so that when you start to get discouraged, all you got to do is look back at the lights all the way down the road and say, I can show you what God has done for me. I may be discouraged right here, but look at what God did here. And 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 look at what God did here. See, now 
now, you got a track record of God's faithfulness. Every story in the Bible is there so that you know that God has done something on the planet, that God's been faithful, that God's been good, that, that, that God is up to something on the back end, and you may not know it, you may not understand. You know, there's some interesting things in the Bible. You know, a nation could split apart. They gather up the army and they're ready to go to war. And all of a sudden the prophet speaks and says, no, this is from the Lord. I'm sorry, what? This is from the Lord. And so they hold their peace and they don't go to war. See, sometimes the tragedies and the things that discourage us, we need to get a God perspective on. This is from the Lord. God's up to something on the back end. God's doing something. God's leading us. You just don't make this mistake they made. They didn't stick with God. They didn't hold on to God. They started worshiping idols. They started allowing their hearts to wander from God. But see, if God's up to something, and this is from the Lord, even though it may be adverse, even though it may be a trial, it may be something that we don't understand, but if this thing's from the Lord, then guess what? I'm going to put a smile on my face because God's up to something good because God is good. Remember his faithfulness. Psalm 105 Verse 4 and 5, I'm going to put it up in the New Living Translation. I like the way it said it in the New Living Translation. Psalm 105, verse 4 and 5 in the NLT says this, Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. That should be the aim of every Christian. That should be the aim of every person who's discouraged. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. Verse 5, remember the wonders of he has performed his miracles and the rulings he has given. See, if you have a hard time remembering, it's time to start writing some stuff down. If you have a hard time remembering, it's time to open up the book again. Because this is a record of God's faithfulness from cover to cover. This, this shows you the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the, the price that God paid and the journey he went on in order to redeem and, and rescue and restore fallen humanity. God is after each and every one of us. Like we say tonight, your love is fierce. He's relentless. He will not be brought off of the course that he is on. God is faithful. Remember his miracle. Remember, remember, remember. We need to remember that God is faithful. Uh, an interesting word search in the Bible is how many times the Bible says that God is faithful. You know why it says it over and over and over again? Because we need to remember. We need to be reminded that, you know what, today may look dark, but tomorrow's coming. Right. We, we need to be reminded, yeah, it might be tough right now, but listen, remember what happened back then. I, I wasn't as strong then as I am now. And God must think I'm stronger now because this is greater than that was. I made it through that. That's why David had to remember, I fought the lion and the bear. This, this Philistine giant, he'll be like one of them. That's why in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses tells him, remember the statutes and the ordinances which I've given you today, lest you wander from God. See, the, all the pressures, all the problems, all the trials are designed to get us off track with God. But God's saying, remember I'm faithful. Remember I'm here. Remember I'm in your corner. Remember that you have the grace of God. Remember you have the strength. Remember my word is available to you. Remember all the promises. Remember I got you through all those trials in the past and you'll be able to handle the pressures of the future. Remember, remember, remember. Last thing for this tonight. Anybody encouraged yet? I got one more for you. I got one more for you is this, don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. Yeah, you can build yourself up in your most holy faith. Yes, you can remember God's faithfulness, but don't go it alone. God did not design us to be an island unto ourselves and just to, just me. Okay, I guess I'll let God in too, right? That's, that's not how God, God designed us to be in a community of believers. And God has designed church and God has designed your brothers and your sisters to be encouragers. Do you know that? Uh, there, there's times where the apostle Paul asks for prayer. Think about that for a second. This is the great apostle. This is the one who had the revelations. This is the one who probably was the one he was talking about caught up into the third heaven. This is the one who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. You need encouragement? You need prayer? 
You got discouraged. In fact, he says there was times where they, they just loathed even life itself. They were discouraged. And there was times, you can find them in the end of the book of Romans and the end of the book of Ephesians, where the apostle Paul says, please pray for me. I need your prayer. Now, can I ask you something? If the great apostle needed others to pray for him and needed others to encourage him because he said there was times where they were discouraged, but then Titus came along. There were times where he was discouraged and he was wondering, he was concerned, the care of the church was on him. And when we could finally stand it no more, we sent Timothy because we said it's better to send Timothy and us be alone than to have Timothy be with us and we'd be pressured and stressed about this problem and this trial that's going on right now. And so I just got to send Timothy. But then Timothy came back and I was encouraged because I heard about your faith. See, if the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle, the one who had, uh, you know, been knocked off his horse by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, if he needed prayer, if he needed encouragement, if he needed community, then what makes us think, I got this, I can do it alone? We need others. We need people in our life, and we don't need to go it alone. We need to be in community. We need to be in faith. We need to be around people who say, you can do it. I've been there before. I made it. Guess what? You can make it. Amen. Sometimes we need to get around people who haven't been through what we've been through. But just by the nature of the fact that they're encouraging, we want to be around them. You got anybody like that in your life? They don't know what you're going through, and honestly, they don't really care. They're just there to say, come on, brother, you could do it. Hey, sis, come on, go for it. You got this. Come on, let's go. God in you is greater than he that's in the world. Come on, let, let's go. Let's do it. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. It's okay. You had a good cry. Uh, you know, sometimes there's people who have a cry ministry. They will cry with you. And afterwards, they will dab your tears and say, okay, honey, it's time to go, time to get on, time to do it. We're not going to sit here and cry anymore. Now we're going to go beat some devil butt, and now we're going to go take on the world, and I got your back. Sometimes you need that dude in the corner of the ring that says, get up, you bum. Come on, you can do it. You're doing the wrong thing. Sometimes you need that, right? We all need that. Sometimes we need a good kick in the pants, but we need other people who are outside of us because we can be so hard on ourselves and we can be so easy on ourselves, right? There's times where we just want to no, know it's, it's, the, the world is really hard and, you know, I, I, I just don't understand why the devil's so mean and, you know, this, this is really unfair. No one else is going through this. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Have you read the news? Have you looked around lately? Everybody's going through problems. Everybody's going through trials. Your sufferings are not unique. In fact, you can read in the Bible, there's people all over the world that are enduring the same sufferings, if not more, greater, harder. Nobody's busting down our doors, putting a gun to our head, saying, renounce Christ or die. No one's doing that. So listen, we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged. My goodness. And as you get around a community of believers, God will use them to encourage your life. Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10, turn there with me. You guys still being encouraged? Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter number 10, turn there with me. Verse number 24 and verse number 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says this. It says, and let us consider one another. That's a good statement right there. We could just camp there for a minute. Let us consider one another. Don't be considering just yourself. It's time to take your eyes and lift them up off yourself and start looking around. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We can get stagnant on our own. We need somebody to fan the coals into flame. We need somebody to stir us up. Sometimes we can get separated like that juice I drank tonight. I had to stir it up. I had to shake it up in order to get all the nastiness mixed around so that it tasted extra nasty when I drank it. <laughs> Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You've got to get the whole thing. You've got to get the effectiveness. You've got to get stuff going on. That's why the book of Galatians says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But look at the next verse, verse 25. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. Some people stop coming to church because they say, I got this. I'm good. I can have a relationship with God by myself. I can just do my thing. I can listen to Christian radio. I can watch live stream messages. I, I can read my Bible. I can pray on my own. Yes, you can, but the Bible says you shouldn't. You can have a great relationship with God, but you shouldn't do it alone. You should be in a community of believers. That's what church is all about, is the gathering of the saints, for the equipping of the saints, for the edification of the body, Ephesians chapter 4, for the building up of itself in love. There's something that takes place when you come to church and one of the greeters is just crazy and he's shouting and he's dancing and he's jumping up and down and he says, hallelujah, it's going to be a fantabulous day. There's something that happens when you come into a church service like that. There's something that happens when the dude that's behind the hot dog stand has a hot dog bun on his head and he's saying, praise the Lord, can I get you one or can I get... See, something happens when you get in a community of people. Something happens when a guy shakes your hand at the back door and he sounds like Chewbacca and he says, hey, that was a great message, Pastor. See, there's something that happens in a community of believers. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some but exhorting one another. Most of the translations you'll find say encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. You know you have a ministry in this church. Even if you are not a volunteer, even if you don't have the schedule and the ability to put in time, you have a ministry. You have a part in the body of Christ. You are a functional believer and you have a ministry of edification. You are to edify the body. You are to encourage people. As you sit there and you smile at other people, as someone raises their hand for the first time and you say welcome, as you pray for this place, as you say, you know what, God, you, this person's face is in my mind. I just want to pray for them. God bless them. Encourage them. I don't know what they're going through, but God, you do. And you take care there and he see you have a ministry in this church that God has called you to come on somebody you do God will use you to build the body of Christ and as the body edifies itself builds itself up encourages itself in love the Bible says that we grow that we become more mature and that we have more effectiveness out there in the world my goodness, when we start to love one another like Christ has called us to love one another, it will be irresistible. People will be coming in off the streets like, I don't know what you guys got, but I need it. Somebody was working next to me and they were just beaming with love and, and they loved me so much and they invited me to church and I said, man, if that person who's so loving has a church, I gotta go find out what's going on at that church. See, that's what's gonna happen when we start to operate as the body of Christ. When we start to take our place and do what God has called us to do, it's called unity, it's called oneness, it's called love and God wants us to operate in it but you can't go at it alone you got to get into the house and you got to get together with other believers <laughs> hallelujah and so much more as you see the day approaching Jesus is coming soon and we're going to have to do this together we need each other what did we learn tonight how to be encouraged number one build yourself up in faith number two look to the faithfulness of God and number three we learned don't go at it alone. Did you guys get something from the word tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated at this time. I want to talk to you about a most important part of the message, most important part of the night for some of you in this place. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart and your life is right with Jesus Christ before we leave. I want to give you an opportunity tonight to make a right relationship with God. Sometimes we come into church like this and we think we're right with God because we sat in church when nothing could be further from the truth. You know that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible, check it out, does it say that because you sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. That's like me saying, you know, I really want to be a fish. And I decide I'm going to be a fish. So I go and I sit in the Pacific Ocean, sit in the water, blow bubbles, swim around, call myself a fish and think that that's going to make me a fish. It doesn't matter what I label myself. It doesn't matter where I am positionally, physically here on the earth. I will never be a fish, maybe a pruny human eventually, but never a fish. And you can't just sit in church and call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people think that they have a right relationship with God because they were raised in church. Parents told them they were Christians growing up. 
hung a cross or a St. Christopher around their neck, had them baptized or christened as a child, went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school class, maybe, maybe catechism class. You've always considered yourself to be a Christian. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslims, Hindus. We're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents raised you in church, tell you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're born in America or because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you in the category of being a Christian headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Sometimes people think, well, you know what? I, I, I've got a right relationship with God. I'm, I'm headed for heaven because, you know, I, I got involved. My last church, I helped out, sang in the choir, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. You know, I've really been a good person, done a lot of good deeds in my lifetime, helped people out, gave money to charities, gotten involved in social justice causes. I believe God's going to let me into heaven because of how good I've been in church and outside of church. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough to get to heaven? No in the Bible say that your religious activity, your charity work or giving will get you into heaven. God's not looking for your volunteer hours or your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, ah, ah I got you on this one. I know God. I know God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I, I celebrate Christmas, sing the songs every year in my life, celebrate the resurrection at Easter. And, and I know God, and I could even quote scriptures to you. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, what do you do with the scriptures in the Bible that say that the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? They know who he is. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and believes he's the Son of God, and yet, even though he can quote scriptures, the devil's not headed for heaven. We all know that. We all understand that. So everybody look up here at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head that counts. Not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus came to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy, did a lot of good deeds. He was raised up in his church called the synagogue. If anybody knew God, it would have been this guy. We would have went to him to find out about God. He could quote scripture, he'd memorize the scripture, he could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And yet when Jesus is talking to him about the same thing that we're talking about tonight, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, rather, what does he say? He says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. It's that simple. You must be born again. Now, I know, I know, we've heard about that in movies, Hollywood, television, books, and the internet. We, we know what being born again really is all about. It's the weirdo stuff, and we don't want to have any part of it. People have failed who have been weird, born again. People who call themselves Christian. I don't want to do that. But listen, if you don't do that, the born again, you're not going to go to heaven. Because Jesus said you must. Not maybe, not it's a way. There's only one way. Not going to get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Not all roads lead to heaven. Going to have to get there one way. And Jesus said, this is the way. You must be born again. Now, let's not let Hollywood movies, television books, and the internet define for us what being born again means. Let's let the Bible do that for us. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. So all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's gross. Graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, it's your call. 
It's your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, well, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Hmm? Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. And yet, you're in a safe place tonight. You're in an encouraging place tonight. We're all for you. We're all excited for you. And to tell you the truth, everyone around you has done this at one time in one way or another. Now it's your turn. Will you do it? Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? It's just as simple tonight by simply raising up your hand. Yeah, it's going to take some courage, but that's okay. You're amongst friends and family tonight. We love you. God is for you as well. Said Jesus, beaten bloody, hung on a cross publicly for all to see. Now tonight, will you give God all of your heart, all of your life in this safe and friendly church? All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, get ready to get your hands up. If you're watching by television in the foyer, down at the cafe, come on, get ready to get your hand up and then tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. If you're watching online, wherever you're at, across the nation and around the world, God sees, God's watching, and you can raise your hand up right where you're at as well. And then we'll pray together. Tonight, we're gonna pray together to invite Jesus in your heart. You're gonna be born again. You wanna be included in that prayer. Get ready to get your hand up when I count to three. Pop my hands together. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one, two, three. God bless you guys. Who else tonight? Who else tonight? You want to be included in that prayer? There's four. God bless you. Who else? Anybody else? There's four. There's five. Got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. Got you right there. Thank you. There's five wise people. You can put your hand down if I already saw you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got you guys right there. Thank you. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Is there anybody else that I did not already see? Back in the family rooms, is there anybody? Anybody on this side that I didn't already see? Just give me a little wave if there is. Anybody else real quick? There's five wise people already. Just want to give you a moment. Check yourself out. Where are you at with God? What if today was the last day? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? If you answer that question, I think, I hope, maybe, I don't know, tonight, come on, make sure. Anybody else real quick in this place? Anybody else? Just want to give you that moment. Just want to give you that moment. Anybody else? There's five wise people already. All right, let's do this. We're going to pray together. So if you want to be included in that prayer, all right, if you raised your hand or even if you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. We're all going to give you a clap and a shout. As we do that, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get your stuff. Whatever you brought with you to church, get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on down right now. Come on. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. They're coming. You can come too. Come on down right now. When the family is, if you want to bring your children, this is their time. Come on, they'll remember this. Hallelujah. Anybody else, if you need to come, just come on down right now. Come on down. All right. Hey, you guys came. Praise God. I'm so happy for you. So glad that you came. Best decision of your entire life right here, right now. Now, I'm going to lead you in that prayer, okay? Everybody else is going to join in with you to encourage you, right? It's an encouraging place. And... As we pray, it's not about the words of your mouth. If you mess up on a word or two, that's okay. Listen, this is not about the words of your mouth. This is about the attitude and the expression of your heart towards God. 
Okay, those of you that are joining us online, you can pray this right where you're at as well. If you raised your hand there in your home or wherever you're at, get ready to pray this prayer together with us, okay? So let's all bow our heads, let's all close our eyes, and everybody together, let's join in and say these words from your heart. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. All my past wrong. Cleanse me and wash me in your blood. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he came, that he died, and was raised again to life just for me. Let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm saved. I'm headed for heaven denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Hallelujah. Okay, now listen. You guys are brand new. You're born again, okay? Now, anybody who's had a baby doesn't leave them at the hospital, right? See you later, kid. Hope you do all right. No, they take them home. They nurture them. They take care of them. We want to continue to encourage you. Okay? You came forward tonight to give God all your heart and all of your life. You didn't join a church, but listen, there is a church here that loves you and wants to help you in your walk with the Lord. So right over here is my friend. This is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. Okay? Sometimes you go to church and wonder, are they weird? This dude's about as weird as it gets tonight. Okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things. Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature take home and read about what to do next in your walk with God. Okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a program we have here with some encouraging people we call spiritual personal trainers. All right? They're just people who come alongside you, help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back to the old way, but you go on with God's new way for your life. Okay? It's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works. And then third thing he'll do, let you come right back out in the church. Okay? Your friends and family will wait for you. If you guys will just make a left turn, take a couple minutes with Pastor Joel. Just head right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight.